to welcome each of you who joined Sibon's uh, webinar today. Uh, my name is Lana Veselova. I'm uh, co-head of International Department at Seabones. Um, if you still don't know us and you are uh, new at our webinar, so we are a data vendor of fixed income market information with uh, 20 years of experience. Uh, and uh, in this way, uh, we have the possibility to communicate with experienced speakers uh, so today's topic of our event uh, is uh, entitled as Are Chinese Bonds Offering an Attractive Entrance? So obviously today we'll speak about high yield bonds uh, again um, in, with the primary uh, focus on Asian markets, of course. Um, but uh, in any case, today we'll cover uh, global markets, we'll have uh, the uh, global view on the market situation today. Uh, today, uh, our main guest is a um, highly experienced uh, chief investment officer and leading expert with 26 year experience, um, um, Andreas Bickel from Blackford Capital. Um, Andreas, uh, if you had a chance to read his profile, uh, previously worked in Goldman Sachs in uh, Deutsche uh, Asset Management at Rothschild. So um, I'm sure this event would be interesting for you as our previous uh, ones. Um, so, uh, in terms of the content, uh, today you will have a, a macroeconomic overview of the uh, situation, basically how it uh, changed since uh, uh, April, since we had probably last uh, uh, seminar. Uh, we'll discuss real wise nominal yields. Uh, of course, we'll speak about uh, sovereign bonds and whether central banks are right now behind the curve or some markets could improve the situation. Um, and of course, we'll um, be more precise in terms of some particular markets and some particular issues uh, on the Asian market and global. Um, so feel free to uh, ask questions um, uh, please put them in question uh, section. I'll pick the most interesting ones. And of course, um, I'll be joined uh, with my colleague, uh, Alessandro Lombardo, who's a uh, uh, co-head of international department. So today we'll also show you the possible ways how you are able to find some attractive uh, investment opportunities in the market. Uh, what is available now. Uh, so uh, please uh, let me pass the floor to Andres uh, and uh, be active as uh, the most interesting questions uh, will be discussed. So don't miss your chance to speak with uh, amazing, wise uh, economists. Andres, how are you doing today? Hi, Lana. Thanks. Good. The weather is at least not bad. It's already helpful. So let's try to dive into, thanks for the introductions. Although you will see single bonds where you can easily act on it if you will, uh, I would like to stress this is not intended to be financial advice. I'm not your financial advisor. And anytime you invest, you need to do your own suitability check and you need to decide yourself if that things which we are going to see is suitable or not. Having said that, let's dive into it. As Lana has already um, presented the agenda, uh, basically the question is, are high yield in, in particular uh, Chinese bonds offering attractive entrance? Uh, the reason for that is obviously uh, straightforward. As we all are aware of, there is a huge change in regulation in China. And therefore, the question is, are bonds at the moment priced in a way it's worthwhile taking the risk? But before that, let's start with macro because macro and the possibility to invest in bonds is uh, tied together. 
And similar to April, the story hasn't changed much, but one key element is different. We have now, with rare exception across the board, an inflation problem, or do we have a problem question mark according to the ECB or the Fed? We don't. Other economists, and I would call, call myself uh, to the later part, uh, we think we have here uh, definitely a longer term issue. But let's start with the US second largest or largest economy of the world, depending on what kind of measurements you are taking. This is the service PMI um, of the US. It has just hit a new record at almost 70. As a reminder, about 50 is um, growth, about 55 is strong acceleration, and about above 60. 60 is really a rare phenomenon, and we are almost at 70. Therefore, it is fair to say that um, steam in the US has picked up. This was coming as a surprise because the figures in August and September were weaker, and now we have a strong boost. This is due to opening. What I would like to stress already here is the component price paid. It has the same scale from 0 to 100, and 50 is the dividing line. We are almost at 83. So there is definitely inflation pressure from the service sector. If we turn on to the manufacturing sector, we do see that also here, the price paid component is above 85. Therefore, also a strong indication that producer price data will come and actually have already come in much higher than previously anticipated. And also in the comments of the people who fill the, the survey, you see that there is an inflationary pressure because the, the, the delivery chain of input goods and also the, the delivery of produced goods uh, is distorted due to COVID, due to closed uh, ports in China. In, in front of California, for instance, there are like 30 ships waiting that the vessel can be unloaded. And this is across the globe. Therefore, we have a lack of input products, chips as an example for cars, but there's many more and this puts inflation pressures. If we continue with the echo data in Europe, as you can see on the right-hand side, the both data are still consolidated above 50 at the area of 55, but falling, and they keep falling for months. And in the middle, you do see that uh, Germany, fourth largest economy of the world, France and Italy, uh, two other very large companies of the Eurozone, they both have multi-month year, uh, multi-month low levels. In Germany, all the indicator besides the ZEW, which came out yesterday, they are all turning down. But there is one hope that ZEW expectation index has sharply risen. Therefore, the conclusion I had until yesterday morning that the ECB is behind the curve is at least questionable. The same can be said about the Fed um, and uh, a very similar statement about the Bank of England. But today's topics are emerging market, uh, therefore let's move on. Asian PMI, so it's exactly the same metric like before. What we do see here is that Japan, one of the largest economy of the world, still has a sharp rebound. It came out of a deep hole. Also Taiwan, uh, mainly chip driven and technology, they are starting to reproduce and they are above 50. South Korea, based on this measurement, is having a soft patch. However, real data of export do show a surge, but we are still uh, below the levels we have seen before the COVID crisis. And China is a mixed bag. I mean, the service sector strongly rebound and uh, the industrial area has had a hit. This is due to the, the regional lockdowns. As we speak, there is again a lockdown in China. So China is, is the tricky bit, and that will be the core of, of the presentation. What is, for me at least, interesting and surprising is that the ASEAN area, so also Asia, but the particular ASEAN, uh, you do see strong rebounds in all that areas. You might remember we have talked about Vietnam in April. It's more on the equity side, but um, 
There, the amazing bit is A, the recovery on, on the macro data or at least on the expectation of the macro data, but B, um, the equity markets are up 40% while they had lockdowns, while they had uh, a lot of goods not shipped out. So this is a, a bit of a conundrum. But the good news is that there is outside of China, India is not shown here, but also India has strong growth. Turning back to China, you have on the right-hand side the manufacturing PMI and on the left-hand side the service. You do see that the service sector is closer to 55 than to 50, while uh, the China is close to the level where uh, it starts to shrink. But in both cases, the second derivative, or if you will, the slope of this curve is positive. So it's open if that is a turning point, but it's a good sign. And if you find Underneath the key findings, in both cases, the new work or the activity in new orders since July have on the service level and on the industrial side sharply risen. So China, from my take, is <clears throat> accelerating on a low level, but it's not falling into a recession. And there is a lot of different debates around, and I will show you for forecasts for China GDP in a second. But from my take, um, the growth situation has slightly uh, uh, lightened and looks better. However, there's a lot of threat around. And the biggest elephant in the room, especially for bond investors, is inflation. Here you see um, the Europe CPI blue line. It's about 4%. Uh, figures will come out shortly. And underneath in bold, you see the producer price inflation year over year has already risen above 14%. Uh, this is for Germany. Germany is the fourth largest economy in the world and it's the export champion. This data is the highest on record and the record begins in 1977. In the 70s until 82, we had strong inflation. So even on that time, uh, there was never such a high inflation pressure from the producer side, which we expect obviously to manifest in consumer and later on in the second round also in wage inflation. Today, as we speak, probably in 10, 15 minutes, the new, newest CPI data for the US will be published. Nordea has in the past very well modeled um, the expectation of, um, of the latest releases. They do expect, based on their models, that the inflation within the next three months will go above 5%. As a reminder, Treasury yields are below 1.5%. And there you already see the key problem for people who are investing in bonds. But we will come back to that. Why do they model that? Well, used vehicles are still not enough there. There is wage pressure and there will be a spillover. There is rents which go up. And there are negative uh, feedback loops from areas like food and energy, which have already um, risen sharply. And that is pent up demand due to the highly vaccinated population and the open up. So therefore, we must expect more inflation in the US, also more in Europe. Not to have just bleak, bleak slides, I thought, is there an area where it looks different? And uh, this, lucky enough, was published today uh, in the emerging Asia space in Central and Eastern Europe and in LATAM, we do see easing of inflation or at least of headline inflation. But it's the only slide which is in this sense positive from the inflation area. When you boil that down, obviously the question is where we end up and we end up in real negative yields for government bonds. So this is the German 10-year yield after taking into consideration the core CPI data, excluding food and energy. So the real figure, if you include other areas which have a huge price increase, is even lower. So you, are, you start below 3%, and as soon as the next CPI data will be published, the likelihood that this drops further this data is unfortunately always lagged at least one month, uh, we will see lower real yield. So not only you, you, you have a starting yield, which is negative, 
you have even after adjusting for inflation a huge, huge negative data. Similar picture in the US, there the figure is roughly 2 spot uh, 5%. However, uh, this graph was done as well um, yesterday, but with the data of September. So if you take into consideration that the treasury yield is lower and that inflation probably today will be higher, it is probably fair to say that um, this 2 spot 5% negative is understating the real effect. Why I'm, I keep preaching that? Well, today uh, was an article published from uh, Russell Napier, who is quite a famous economist and strategist. And he, ca he, he basically said in a very sophisticated way um, that the financial repression, which I have first presented on the Seabond seminar in Hong Kong and since then uh, from time to time, is here to stay. Financial repression means you take away money from people who save. You push people into non-performing assets like government bonds, like investment grade bonds. After taking into consideration of inflation, you end up with negative yield. Now you still probably think, what on earth? Here you have real life data from Switzerland. You see from 1929, there was deflation and then there was inflation until recently. Uh, we had a 2% inflation over that period, which is probably a lifetime span. So I do know people who are roughly in that age and still alive. You were to lose 86% of your purchasing power. With the rule of 72, in the title, you see 2% inflation. In Switzerland, we are at once for two roughly, but in Germany, about four. In America, probably about five. Um, with 2% after 36 years, you have half in your purchasing power. If it's 4%, obviously it takes only 18 years. And if it takes 18 years, you can break it down how much you lose every year. And that's an awful lot. Therefore, you should definitely care about inflation and you should definitely care where to deploy money to protect you from that. US high yield is an obvious um, example, but the bad news is uh, after taking into consideration uh, inflation data with the bracket, uh, it excludes food and energy, you end up with a negative yield of roughly 3.35%. So I buy American corporates in a junk area and I lose money. This is not normal, and obviously it's not sustainable, and it destroys your wealth. Here you see the global market uh, in terms of spread. So you see the, the lowest spread, so the least yield you get in LATAM, and the uh, highest is globally, including Asia. But even the global, if you include everything, 3 spot 8% rounded uh, is not much, plus the basic of the, of the relevant... Uh, government bond. And to make matters worse, uh, so you lose already money when you invest in nominal terms, you are around zero or a bit above, depending on the currency in the region and on the rating. Uh, after inflation, you are negative, but across the globe, with excluding China, Hong Kong, and at the moment postponing uh, the UK, but that might come in one, two months, excluding at the moment, obviously, the ECB, which might wait till 2023, and the Fed, similar picture, we have and expect rate hikes. We had already 70 rate hikes and more is expected. This is a chart also from today. Uh, that means you not only lose as a starting point, but during the holding period, with rate hikes, uh, yields go up and the price of your bonds drop much further. So definitely a very bleak message for bondholders at the moment. If we look then uh, again at inflation, but this time in China, as we go now back to the, to the, to the core China, uh, you see CPI 1.5%. Well, it's a high figure. If I look at the white line here, I would say, yes, it's higher than expected but it's still contained. But the real story is also here, not just in Germany, not uh, like in America. 
also here that PPI is up more than 13% year over year. And that's huge, definitely huge. And we buy this product, so the, the, the input factors are rising, therefore the price of the product will rise, and therefore our purchasing power is also threatened from that angle. And the question is, how is the growth outlook? For China, I'm slightly more positive than the red line of GS, uh, but definitely the growth will be around five or lower, five percent or lower. So I mean, if CPI at one spot five, okay, still real growth. If I take PPI into consideration, looks a bit worse. I'm not so convinced that there won't be stimulus in China, or actually I'm convinced there will be stimulus. However, it will be most likely on the fiscal front. So now the key question is, are Asian and in particular Chinese um, emerging market corporates in the non-investment grade area attractive? If you look at the white line which includes everything besides property you see there was no, no much spread widening and um, you get roughly two to 250 percent uh sorry basis point more yield than comparable bonds in the in the u.s market but uh, the problem is the blue line this chart is already two weeks old so you see we had a blow up of uh, the high yield spreads i happened to find the same chart in bloomberg which I managed uh, to update. So the chart was produced uh, in the middle of last month. That is where we had this red cross, a uh, red black circle, which was a record. However, in the meantime, we had a mini relief rally, which we actually used to, to sell some, um, some uh, bonds, which were hit a lot. But since then, we are back to that level and have even overpassed. And, and, and now it's the question, is that overdue? Are there opportunities or are there only threats? Bloomberg says if on the onshore market, there are a lot of opportunities. Actually, the default ratio in onshore is no stress. And also in the A-rated bond area, there is a bit of stress, but the local, uh, local bonds are okay -ish. But the offshore markets, so where we can invest, uh, has a lot of stress. The reason why this stress is rising was this uh, publication. Um, this is the year over year uh, change in the contracted sales, so of flats and houses the Chinese guys buy. And here you have the main players, most of them are double b plus some are investment grade and look what happened year over year with two exceptions a huge drop so that caused the the recent last two weeks um second sell-off county garden is a very well known name investment grade uh, we will go to agile we will go to sunak uh, sunak is state on chimau is a very solid name it's almost at the bottom of the list uh, real default rates actual roughly nine billion the market was pricing in at the at the middle of october more than 30 billions in the meantime we have risen higher i don't know how the metrics exactly would turn out but we can assume that it's more than 40 billions priced in to my knowledge there was no further default since then. This week, Evergrande has to pay another coupon, so it will be tricky. But so far, the real life is we are roughly at 9 billion. You see here um, how much coupon or refinancing in November will, will be done. And this is a huge itimus test this month. Uh, after this month, we will probably know more in detail if is there are opportunities or if there are more threats. And uh, even if the answer is to the left or to the right, in the end, you are choosing companies, uh, the bottom up stock picking in terms of corporates. Here you see 
the same data in a different way. You see it with risk return. And I said, we turn back to Agile. So you see that on the top in the left-hand corner, you see a six spot, 7% Agile bond. It's not written when it matures, but uh, let me tell you, it will be March next year. And you see the risk return, you see it from other bonds. <clears throat> Let's dive into it. And again, this is not a buying recommendation or a selling recommendation. This is just analysis. The bond has dropped within four weeks from roughly 100 to below 70. Um, you see underneath on the right hand side, uh, one year default risk distribution expectation. We are in the, in the riskier part. However, I remember when the shale gas uh, area in the US was there, most bonds didn't default. And if you look above, this is a model Bloomberg does, Moody's does something similar derived from the equity market. They, they, they derive a probability of default. And the ratio has risen, but still uh, it is open. And if you turn in the middle, you see what the equity guys tell you. And the equity guys tell you more than 55% are in a buy, two are in a sell, and, and let's say the holds are also sell. So, but there is more positive than negative um, expectation. The aggregated return potential for all analysts, including the holds and the sales, is more than 100%, although the expected growth is uh, minus 50% roughly. What it means is, the equity guys compared to the credit guys uh, have a complete different assessment. We will know in March who is right, but by definition, both cannot be right. I think it was Standard & Poor's, they have recently um, published a report basically saying that the company has more than enough cash to satisfy all the cash needs for coupon payments and the refinancing over the coming one to two years. So here is the, is the layout. Uh, if they do not go bankrupt, uh, that's a great buying opportunity. But obviously the risk, the which is the market pricing in is high. And now look at this. This is from the Financial Times. You see Agile was circled on purpose. Uh, there are three criteria how um, in future um, you can grow your debt. And if you are fulfilling the three criteria, which are labeled above, then you are a green company or a yellow or an orange. And uh, de depending on that, you can still grow with more debt or you, you are limited or if the red one, you cannot increase your debt level. Turning back to the starting point, and this graph is really not old, it's roughly two weeks old. Uh, I see here a lot of names, which Sina Ocean as an example, Shimao, you, you, if you remember the chart from below before, if I were to find it, oops. So we have here Shimao, uh, we have Agile, they are at the bottom of the list in terms of sales growth, but at the same time, um, they have more than enough cash to survive. And most of them, but not all, and that's the problem, they will survive. Some of them are even uh, investment grade, like country garden. Underneath, I gave you also prices of uh, another Agile bond, which matures in August. Also that one you buy at the ridiculous price of below 80. But the risk is huge. And if you look on the left-hand side, you we, we remember all painfully Evergrande. Evergrande was, already at that time and before, obviously, in the orange area, but it was definitely not red yet. And uh, Evergrande is not yet officially defaulted. Um, they have even restarted building uh, houses and uh, they repaid the, the delayed coupon. But uh, obviously this week we will find out how it looks like. 
here is uh, the, uh, another Achille bond, the one I mentioned before. So it was dropping below 80 within no time, but since then it has even dropped further. This is one example, but there's an even better one. Uh, Sino Ocean is state controlled and state owned to 30% roughly, has 40 times more cash than Evergrande, is not at risk at all, at least to default uh, due to liquidity. But look where the bond is priced. And therefore, if that one is not going bankrupt, and even if it were to, maybe the state will draw, uh, will, will, will come in. That's a huge possible return. Repeating, this is not a buying recommendation. It, it just shows you, if you are a risk taker, if you are able to size the poison, the risk in, in, in the right dimension and to diversify it, in a diversified bond portfolio in Chinese property bonds, on average, you will do great. But due to the lack of good governance and accounting system, we cannot know which one will default and which one will not, because the credit metrics of these examples, also Greenland, Greenland um, is here orange, but in this case, Moody's has written um, a report in August, basically stating, yes, Greenland has certain risks and is only fulfilling one of the three criteria. However, they have enough cash for the next 48 months. In the meantime, the Greenland bond dropped to 43, has to recover to 65 roughly, and is now hovering around there. It, does it go bust? We don't know. It is definitely a huge risk. But Greenland has a similar price to Aguile, which is green, has a similar price to Country Garden or to Shimao, which are definitely better quality. Or you see here, Sino Ocean is even investment grade, but trades like junk. So if you have capability and resources to do your homework and to pick your individual bonds and you find them all on C bonds, uh, there is a huge opportunity, but there are a lot of threats and there will be accidents and there will be accidents on areas which you cannot foresee. Where shall you invest given this rather bleak outlook? If uh, Mr. Napier is right with his forecast, he basically says that the financial repression the compressed yield, the, the manipulation of the yield by, by central banks and the state will last for at least 15 years. Inflation is here to stay. Uh, if you look at this landscape and the, if you have and want to invest, probably emerging market high yield is the base, safest in brackets, safest place at the moment. While in the US, um, I would say there the research is the best. You can be quite sure about the faults, but adjusting for inflation, you lose money, similar obviously in the euro area. Asia is on one hand offering you tremendous yield, tremendous opportunity, but at the same time, it offers you a lot of threats due to transparency. So if you are continuing to invest into bonds, you should definitely uh, think about an allocation to higher yielding bonds, but at the same time, you have to have risk uh, control, you have check and balances, and you have to be able to, to survive a default. The summary of uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, reasons why high uh, equity markets offer good risk to, uh, return right now, right now means two weeks ago. Well, the valuation is cheap pricing as priced in all the downside. Actually, they were pretty wrong about that because since then we have dropped another five to 10% depending on bonds. Um, we do believe that the default risk is, is, is in real terms lower than what is priced in. The technical of the market looks for a rebound and uh, Morgan Stanley expects more monetary easing. I really hope that they are wrong because monetary easing is not really doing the trick. You need fiscal stimulus and you probably need support of certain companies that they will survive.
Having said that, most likely there are opportunities in this area. Personally, I would invest also in other areas like commodities. We go here fast through because this is a bond seminar. What copper is needed for electrical vehicles um, is or has had correction period since um, roughly June. Uh, Goldman Sachs expects the price of uh, commodity to go to 15,000 and uh, Bank of America speaks even of 20,000 over the next four years. If that's going to materialize, obviously uh, copper mining or products on copper will do well. My personal favorite high risk is if you really want to be carbon neutral, solar, wind and all the other alternatives will not be sufficient because the battery power is too low and the production capacity will be too low. Very controversial is uranium green. If you ask a physicist, he will tell you yes. When you produce uh, electricity with it compared to oil, gas, etc., no emission. If you ask a normal person or the German government or the Swiss government, and they will tell you, well, this is actually a dirty energy sources because the waste at the end. The cherry is still out. Fact is that uranium um, has after the 12 year bear market started to rise and uran mining here shown two ETFs. They have surged, really surged more than 170% year, uh, in one year. Um, oil is probably going up further because of the demand, the seasonality, but I would not recommend to buy ETNs or ETNs which track oil price because they are in futures, future are in contango, and the contango means that you lose when you roll. Oil is obviously not ESG compliant, um, so if you are following ESG concerns and restrictions, uh, this is no area, but uh, nevertheless, oil and gas producers are in a divesting phase, they pay a high dividend and they have protected you in the past from inflation. And we do expect that over the midterm, not long term, because oil will have a lot of headwinds, but over the midterm, it could protect you. Here you see the estimated um, increase of demand. And you also see, or, or at least you can read that we are now on pre-COVID levels. So the consumption of energy is now at levels where we have been last year in January. Uh, gold hasn't worked. We all know that. Uh, reasons uh, you see here last year after COVID, a lot of people bought gold physically and even more bought it in ETFs or ETNs. In the meantime, they have dropped it. Most of them have bought um, bitcoins or, or cryptocurrency, if you will. However, at least until yesterday, uh, gold has um, done another attempt to break out of this uh, trading range. I really don't know when it breaks out. There's hard to see a trigger. In theory, inflation is here. Inflation is here to stay and gold will protect you over the midterm from that. If that's going to happen now, if it's going to happen in 12 months, nobody knows. But physical gold can and I believe will uh, forward-looking protect you from inflation, at least partially. Last but not least, I'm not giving any advice on Bitcoin, but knowing that there will be always questions. Um, I had this chart in previous presentations and basically what I said before, I believe, given what I hear from the community of the crypto asset uh, guys, we go to first to 60, then break above, and next stop 120,000. Uh, in the meantime, that has happened, uh, at least the first part of it. If the second one is going to happen, nobody knows. But if I have to bet, and I repeat, to bet, because I cannot evaluate Bitcoin, um, it's going probably more up than down over the coming months. And therefore, it could be, what really could be for people who want to gamble, and I repeat, gamble and not investing, a place to invest. They are long short guys in the market. That's a different animal that might work. Uh, but um, just to be straight long is for me a gamble. So with that, let me summarize. We have seen significantly spread widening in the Chinese corporate market, especially in, in, the, in the real estate area. 
I believe that there are a lot of opportunities and on average you will make money. But the key and the tricky bit will be to, to, to pick winners, given the information, given the, the accessibility, given the erratic development of um, the government, which sector, which company they regulate. I believe that um, we will face for the Fed, for the ECB problems that they might be behind the curve at the moment, at least in the US, we see an acceleration of growth. The Bank of England has badly surprised because they didn't raise rates. However, it was expected that this will happen. Across the globe, we have seen more than 70 rate hikes and we expect more as I've shown. But the key, key, key message is I strongly believe and I really preach that since mom, at least March this year, inflation is here to stay. This word transitory is um, can be interpreted in different ways. The latest one of Mrs. Yellen was, well, at least until mid next year, 4%-ish is reasonable before it might then come down because it's transitory. Hmm. Nobody can know what will happen until then. But with that statement, basically she says inflation is sticky and will stay on a higher level than we were used over the last 12 years. And with that, obviously we are back to Everything which has nominal yield uh, is spreaded, normally offers negative real yield. Uh, the, the impact of the government to transfer wealth away from savers, away from the private sector to them is here, that is called financial repression. So you put on one hand inflation up indirectly, obviously. And on the other hand, you force insurances, pension funds to buy government bonds, which uh, deliver you negative real return. And you steal it from the people who have an insurance there or uh, their pension there, because even if you get nominal the same amount, uh, I've shown you the example, you definitely lose the purchasing power quite quickly with 4%. Important is that we see more fiscal stimulus, this we have seen. That has two effects. On one hand, it is growth, it helps uh, to survive companies, but on the other hand, it will also create more inflation. On the bond area, we are where we were in spring with one key difference. Inflation is now much higher, so corporate high-yielding bonds do offer you nominal positive yield, and fortunately, most do offer you negative yields and um, if you consider inflation. We believe that in Asia, there are opportunities in particular, which are covered today in more details in Asia and uh, in China. However, there are other areas. Last but not least, if you are willing to accept a real negative yield, we still believe risk return is quite decent in US high yield. Areas where we wouldn't invest at all is cash for obvious reasons. Of course, you need as much cash as to fulfill your cash needs, cash flow payments, etc. But apart from that, cash is in brackets trash. It will cost you money. The same holds true for investment grade bonds and for government bonds. I have said where you could invest, so mining shares, energy, industrial metals, gold. I didn't mention weeds. You could also consider um, uh, old timers are, but these are areas where, where it's really hard to, to sell when you want to, to realize the gains. But these are real assets which could protect you from, um, from uh, inflation. Equities are also an area, but there you, you have to be selective. And um, I, I can say more about it, but this is not about equities. With that, uh, let me quote uh, Baron Rothschild. I mean, I prefer the German version, but the German version is basically buy when the cannons are still firing. However, he, it seems the original uh, statement he made was buy when there is blood in the streets, like now in, for instance, Chinese property bonds, even if the blood is your own. I mean, a disclosure, we were invested in a certain bonds. Um, in a multi-asset portfolio, we are all above zero, but uh, it would be a lie to say that we made money with these corporate bonds uh, in the property area. Last but not least, if you are interested in uh, more pronounced views on all asset classes, uh, feel free to follow 
us on my Telegram channel. The Telegram channel is called Dr. Biko Knows Best. Marketing guys did its best to, to promote it in terms of the title. Um, nevertheless, uh, feel free to join. With that, uh, I have come to the end of the presentation and I would like to open it up for questions. Thanks a lot for listening. Uh, thank you very much for your comprehensive overview. We basically uh, have made the dynamics of uh, changes in bond market, in equities, even bitcoins today. So uh, we do have um, a few questions in the chart. Uh, and actually, it is really nice that the first question is about uh, credit ratings. That's basically that was also one of my key questions, which I really wanted to ask uh, you. So we opened uh, the um, question rather open, especially for China market and for Asian market. Uh, it is rather hidden. Uh, zone where whether you invest or gamble. So um, can we expect that rating agencies will downgrade all China real estate bonds uh, because of the uh, recent events uh, and go from investment rate to junk, uh, from junk to single B or C within a couple of months if uh, uh, nothing changes, especially with the negative yields? Oof, yeah, I, I expect that this question um, and it is a, a very difficult one to answer because as we probably all know, everybody who follows bonds for some years knows that the uh, rating agency are uh, perfect in telling us after the fact slash after the hit of the bond price that actually uh, they were wrong. Well, they never say they were wrong, but they cut the rating and they changed the outlook to negative on the top. Is this going to happen um, in China? I mean, on average, for sure, they will downgrade some of them. But the key point is, and there we are back to where I started. Do I know if examples, not advice, if Country Garden or um, uh, Sunak, both uh, investment grade, will they become junk? I don't know. Um, I, I would bet one yes, one no, but I, I'm, I'm not able to tell you if it's A or B. And, uh, and to be fair, I mean, you have the luck that now Russian bonds are mostly investment grade. However, if you see at the ratings and you are the expert, I shouldn't even open my mouth, but just to give you the Western view, if you will, um, if I look at what the ratings agency, the big ones say, and then the local ones say, I see a gap. And in that case, I trust more your local guys because you're closer to it. Exactly. I have the same opinion. You know, local guys should know more. Um, and, and sorry, one last sentence to that. In some cases, there are local ratings for Chinese bonds, at least on Bloomberg. Um, they are similar to what I, I've experienced from your market or from LATAM. On average, they are one or two notches better. And most of the time, but unfortunately not always, they are spot on or better, better position than um, the large free rating agencies. Yeah, well, as you can see uh, in our platform, we have also Dagon uh, and uh, some other rating agencies with, uh, which are rather local. So it's interesting to compare actually their dynamics. Um, okay, so, uh, and as for, since we are discussing uh, credit ratings, so what kind of uh, credit level would you consider now like a starting point uh, when you consider investments? Um, I mean, your example was like uh, BB minus uh, with uh, Aguila. Uh, so, what kind of uh, if we consider like uh, B plus area uh, starting from this point, would it be okay, or it is a high risk that they will be downgraded really soon? I mean. Not knowing what the agency will do, but I would uh, look at things which have investment grade. So one is Country Garden as an example. Last time I checked, the price was uh, below 80 or around 80. It can be that it becomes junk, uh, but this has a really strong balance sheet. Also the Sunak most likely, 
uh, should should be a, should should survive and might become junk. But I would start higher than where I normally would go. Normally I would start in the double B plus. But assuming that these uh, nice ratings um, are probably uh, going to be changed to the downside, um, <clears throat> it is probably safer to start there. Unless I say I have so much money to deploy, I can make zero spot five percent bets, and you might do a, a portfolio of five, six, maybe more of, of really risky ones. And you 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 in your mindset uh, assume that one or two go bust. But if you buy them at sixty five, and one or two goes bust, and the others go to one hundred, on overall you made your money. However. In real life, if you do that for an institutional investor or for a family office guy, you are history. Although the return would be great, therefore, I, I would stick to what I said at the beginning. If it's uh, for an institution, if it's for somebody who wants to preserve value in this space, uh, start uh, with what's today investment grade, assuming that it won't be in six months' time. But let me rephrase it in another way. Somebody asked, do you believe that China will be bigger in five years, in one year? The answer is probably yes. Do you believe that uh, the real estate sector, which is roughly 30% of GDP, will still be roughly 30% of GDP? The answer is probably yes, even if it's 25. And now it comes the tricky bit. We don't know which one will be in these 25. But for a starting point, if you start with the best rated, or you can look at the balance sheet, and our deal is, is definitely a border case. It's really a gamble, um, and we will know in March. But if it's not going bust, I mean, do the math. However, if you size that bit too much and it goes bust, I don't know where the recovery value is. Is it 60 where it's priced, or is it 30, or is it zero? Because the Chinese government also said, in case of defaults, we will ensure that our local guys get the bonds, get the coupons and the flats will be built. They didn't say anything about the international guys. And therefore you can conclude what that means. Um, okay, I'm reading a few questions in the chat as well. Uh, so speaking about the Chinese market, so basically it is more presented in terms of real estate companies. Um, so uh, we have a question that um, these companies are highly leveraged and dependent on the real uh, estate prices. So uh, are they still attractive uh, opportunities uh, or it could be rather vulnerable right now? I mean, are they highly leveraged? The answer depends uh, on which part. If you remember this green, greenish uh, mm -hmm. slide, Based on the criteria the Chinese government has imposed, the green ones, they are very leveraged and they can increase their leverage. But the future depends on the contracted sales growth. And that was the chart I, I showed. And because the figure in October was uh, so dreadful, so falling, now they price in defaults of all the green bonds and obviously all the orange and red ones. And not all the, the green ones uh, will survive, but most of them. Um, the balance sheet, you have obviously look case by case, but given the metrics uh, we know uh, for the Chinese government, they are in a way regulated or leveraged uh, that they are okay for them. And yes, they are to a certain degree attractive, but they come with a huge risk because if you buy an investment grade bond with a coupon, I, I don't know exactly, but let's just make a simple example of roughly four and a half percent and you buy it at 75. I mean, we are, we are all long enough in this bond business. This yield has to come with a certain risk. Uh, true. Uh, also, one more question. So, do you expect that Chinese government will intervene uh, at a certain moment in the real estate sector in order to stabilize um, the sector, given the importance of it uh, in uh, GDP number? I mean, they officially said in the case of Evergrande, which is one of the richest guy in, in the background of China, mm -hmm. um, he should use his private wealth and they will not intervene. And at the same time, they push them to, to, to pay and somehow actually they have intervened because they told the banks 
that they can still use the loan. They should not cut uh, the, the, the LTVs. So in the background, yes, they have already intervened. And we don't know when and if, but I would strongly bet that they will not let this 30% go down the drain. And, and not because they are so generous, et cetera, et cetera. No, no, no. Because people have bought flats, which will be finished in one or two years time. And if they, these flats are not finished and on top of it, they lose their money, they have um, riots. And um, roughly eight to 10% of the population is in the party. So having said that 90% are in brackets free uh, citizens in brackets, nevertheless, this is the biggest threat of, of, of the system. If there are riots, not just in one city, but across the country, and therefore they will do everything um, to prevent that. That doesn't mean that they will protect the foreign investors because they couldn't care less about the foreign investors, but definitely for local guys. And now the tricky bit, if you are from abroad, uh, which one of the international bonds will survive? That's basically uh, the answer to one of the questions. So uh, we did had a question in the chat that Chinese government helps a lot uh, local investors, but uh, leaves foreigners uh, rather helpless. So the, the question was, is it a reality? And like, yes. So um, do let's see uh, which ones, um, how would you evaluate which ones will stand? Um, I mean, a few criteria on, on your choice. I mean, I would start obviously with the balance sheet, how much leverage there is, and I would try to find out how much free cash flow they generate. You find that on Bloomberg. I'm not sure if you have the date on C1's tool. Uh, because oh, you can check uh, IFRS reports as well. Yeah, but now it comes the tricky bit. Uh, most of them, they look pretty good but you don't know if the figures are cooked or not. Exactly. So this is also a rather tricky area, uh, which is why, for me, Asian markets are still rather unknown. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to tell you, um, for us, in the past, your market was as well the same. And um, <laughs> now you are investment great. <laughs> so, um, yes, I mean, this is a high risk. It's a high controversial and... Um, do I trust the Chinese government? No. The only thing I would like to add that this regulation we see now has happened in the past. In the past, they did uh, regulate other sectors and it, they hit them as well. Uh, what you cannot know is which sector is next. I mean, the real estate sector is probably plus minus known the threats, but there will be probably more regulation. Mm -hmm. Well, seems like Asian story is pretty much uh, discussed. So let's uh, summarize probably on the global market. So uh, which markets you still uh, think are worth consideration for uh, investors? So for instance, Latin, uh, Latin American uh, markets, they are pretty popular. What do you think about them uh, as of now? Yeah, I mean... Uh... The yield is unfortunately low, but in Brazil, disregarding the problem with the government and the COVID situation, they look quite stable. Of course, the yield is extremely low. Uh, we have problems in Mexico. Um, the outlook of the economy looks okay. However, certain companies, especially in the credit leasing area, Credito Real as an example, they have dropped like, like a bomb because there was a fraud in the sector. And um, uh, I, I would go probably for certain state near state owned companies in Brazil. Um, the best research market is obviously the US. Um, you still get higher uh, yield than uh, in Europe. Europe had, by the way, a very good year. Um, but uh, forward looking, if I am going to invest in bonds, I am probably going to buy uh, US, um, some Brazilian, and where I can and where I have a large enough pool of assets, I might add a tiny bit of, uh, of these Asian bonds. But, but, but wait a second. But yeah. 
The question is, shall you not diversify to certain other areas? And it doesn't have to be equities. That's why I included the other areas. Mm -hmm. And what do you think about high yield in euros? Does it still exist? Because that was my really last question a few days ago when uh, one portfolio manager said, I'm uh, having high yield uh, portfolio only in uh, euro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I mean, that person is a lucky person this year because he had a tremendous return. But are these yields you are getting, and I showed the chart, it's the lowest in the high yield space, really worth taking the risk? Because in the end, you take an equity risk and the return, if I was not, uh, if my memory is not completely wrong, two and a half or, or, or three percent, while the inflation is five. Mm. Yes, that is a market. I, I personally believe in, in euro after the rally, uh, the risk return is not really worthwhile. And, and, and on the other hand, if this inflation theme is transitory, like the ECB keeps telling us, like the Fed keeps telling us, so in one to three years' time, you probably have, again, um, decent returns. But in the meantime, you definitely lose after inflation some money. Okay, Andre, thank you very much for your time. I think uh, we will still have one more meeting uh, as uh, as usual to sum up uh, the year. Uh, but we'll see. I hope, uh, hope our plans will make true. Thank you very much for taking time to share your opinion how we are going and which markets could be more or less interesting right now in terms of high yield. Uh, and now I would like to pass the floor to my colleague, Alessandro Lombardo, and we'll try to see uh, where and which ways are possible to find uh, some high yield bonds. Hi, hello everyone. Hello, thank you very much, Lana. And thanks also to Andreas as well for his extremely interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Alessandro Lombardo. I'm the, the co-head of Seabonds International Department. I work with potential Seabonds uh, clients and current clients all over the world. By the way, I see that uh, we have today a lot of current clients uh, following our webinar, and that's very, very good. Uh, and now we are going to present basically the main tools of the platform. My colleague Lana will do this uh, in, a, in a few minutes. I will just make a brief introduction of, of uh, what has been done and what we are doing right now to add, let's say, values to different kind of investors. So let's say, um, I will just say a few words regarding what has been done by, by our team also this year. Uh, first of all, we incredibly strengthen our bond coverage and our research and analysis tools in general. So basically, we currently provide detailed information on, on over 600,000 bonds uh, from 180 countries. This is quite interesting as it's one of the most comprehensive coverage we provide uh, in general among all the kind of data providers uh, all over the world. So we have now 100% coverage of all the European markets, so it's full coverage of the European markets, and more than 300 primary sources of prices among stock exchanges uh, and OTC market participants, so basically 50-50, let's say. Uh, we now also fully cover the equity market, and we are going to add as well the ETFs uh, to our database. Uh, let's say that, of course, the bond coverage uh, represents the most valuable part of uh, the platform, uh, but it's very convenient for investors to check also other assets uh, uh, in one single box, which is very easy to use, let's say, and very convenient. We are now really able with the tools we have to satisfy different requirements of different investors' profiles, from retail investors to financial consultants, from portfolio managers of asset management companies to bank back offices. So let's say that, let's say that the need uh, but the, 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 all the requirements can be satisfied with the different kind of service we provide because we provide, for example, the web access to the information. We provide also the Excel Adin extension to visualize data directly from, uh, from Excel and also uh, the API services, which is one of the most, uh, let's say, convenient uh, ways to receive our data feeds in a structured way. So basically, you pay for what you require. Now, Lana, we will present the main tools available on the platform, but we also invite you to organize uh, with me and Lana, of course, a face-to-face -face, uh, meeting that we can schedule via Zoom or Skype or what is more convenient for you. 
to discuss your personal requirements. So basically, we are usually able to uh, be, be very, very flexible to find a solution uh, for any kind of request. So if you are interested, just drop us a line. We are going then to leave also our contact, of course. You will receive an automatic email with my email and Lana's one at the end of the seminar. And we are going to be very happy to schedule a, a meeting together. So now uh, you can all enjoy Lana's brilliant presenting skills. The main uh, question is where to get these high yield bonds, or in any case, where you are able to compare uh, different markets and choose your own strategy, uh, where you are able to verify some information and find uh, probably uh, your prospectus in order to pass the compliance. Uh, and just to see all your covenants, uh, just to uh, have your kind of like insurance uh, and uh, some financial for it. So um, I'll be pretty short uh, in terms of the demonstration. Uh, it uh, will be sweet <laughs> and uh, rather user friendly uh, in terms of our platform. So um, uh, the main functionality which I think uh, should be in your hands is the bond screener. Um, since uh, if you still are not um, uh, familiar with our tools at our new platform, uh, so you can uh, check all our upgrades. Uh, as of now, it is very convenient to check on each market, you are able to visualize uh, all the preferences and basically you are able to put your uh, criteria in terms of yield, in terms of rating and uh, just interesting um, analyze it. So I just uh, had a chance in order to avoid some time on pause. So for instance, you can analyze Asian market uh, I shift uh, the uh, yield starting from three uh, up to pretty much um, uh, high with mid maturity and the starting uh, rating level is uh, WB minus. So uh, you have the possibility to have uh, your list of bonds. Each bond has all your criteria, all your preferences. You can basically uh, specify whether you want to have some particularly uh, type of the bond or you want to exclude, let's say, subordinated bonds or uh, any um, callable bonds if you want. Uh, so you have very convenient list of um, bonds with around 60 descriptive parameters, which you are able to download in Excel and, of course, analyze it in a structured way. Uh, but I would like to show you a very interesting functionality, which we recently added. Uh, so um, uh, you are able to visualize all your bond search results on the yield map uh, in terms of yield and duration. Uh, if you want, you can uh, just enlarge some part uh, in order to analyze some particular duration, let's say. Um, you can add your benchmark, let's say UST, uh, in order to see where these bonds are corresponding. Uh, or in case you already have your benchmark or some bond which you refer to, you are able to add um, some uh, point uh, at your preferences right here. Uh, if you deal in different uh, currencies, you are able to put uh, any benchmark. It could be gilts, uh, bonds, um, uh, as you prefer. So very convenient that you are able to uh, go directly to this uh, page and uh, analyze all the parameters. Uh, so I. Uh, in a very structured way, you have all your uh, bond data, uh, so uh, you're able to save it in PDF to make your nice reports or uh, to send to your clients. 
uh, or if you uh, like old-fashioned way, <laughs> sometimes I just uh, want to relax and um, look at uh, the paper. Uh, so we can um, use all our analytical tools which are represented on a single page. Uh, so uh, you don't need to go back and forth in order to calculate your yield to maturity, accurate coupon interest, uh, PVP, convexity, uh, any parameter which you need, or just simply just the price. Um, as of now, the uh, crucial matter is uh, prospectuses, final terms. So uh, feel free to check our coverage as uh, it exceeds uh, rather uh, reputable uh, data sources like Bloomberg or Reuters, uh, pretty much in. 25% or something like that. So you are able to analyze the dynamics of changes of price. And um, as I already mentioned, he wants his uh, data aggregator with 20 year uh, history. So the historical archives uh, of prices and yields are uh, rather big. So you're able to visualize uh, the dynamics of price, uh, yield, spread. Uh, now you are able to compare uh, bonds uh, and indices. Uh, let's say uh, if I want to compare, uh, so we are now at Alibaba, uh, bond, let's compare uh, with uh, see bonds Asia. Corporate high yield and yield to maturity index. In order to see where these bond corresponds uh, among all uh, corporate high yield bonds uh, at this situation, uh, you are able to visualize and compare a few bonds, for instance, and see uh, the spread between them. Um, as we already mentioned, um, we provide the prices from around 300 sources, 50-50 uh, from uh, stock exchanges and market participants. So you are able to see um, market participant calls and uh, end of the day calls from all the stock exchanges, including FINRA. Um, trace and feed disclosure. So basically, that's how market participants actually close their deals. Um, in case uh, you have uh, interesting corporate uh, who has bonds and equities on their balance sheet, uh, so Sibons provides information on stocks or equities as you prefer. Uh, as well. So this is very convenient to analyze the total depth uh, of this uh, issue with the two numbers and C. Um, uh, and um, as we already discussed with uh, Andreas, right now it is very uh, crucial to monitor the situation uh, from uh, rating agencies. Uh, so here you get the updates four times a day. So you are able to track uh, all the situation in order to see how these bonds are performing. Uh, and of course, you can check uh, their financial reports in order to see uh, the uh, situation with the market. And as the indicative uh, thing, you can see the uh, institutional holders of these bonds. So usually funds who invest in such bonds are um have some policy i hope so and so uh, you're able to see the appetite and the market uh, for such bonds um so uh having said that so you are able to track all your bonds which you uh, have uh, as of now uh you can set the alerts for instance in our watch list uh in order to uh uh, to have a hunt on bonds so you can set your price yield alerts and when the bond hits certain points you are ready to buy or sell bonds you'll be worrying about such things 
in any case, uh, if you're interested in more detailed presentation or you have some uh, questions in terms uh, how to uh, find some bonds, uh, if you have some difficulties in uh, monitoring some markets or just want to uh, improve your portfolio management uh, tools, feel free to uh, contact uh, me and my colleague Alessandro. Um, we have different solutions uh, starting from just a subscription to the website uh, with the very uh, convenient tools uh, like mobile app or just uh, web access or you can uh, have more customized solutions uh, and autom automatic way of receiving born data. Uh, via API or just ready-made Excel files. Uh, all right, uh, in case you have some questions uh, to me or Alessandro, feel free to write them in a chat or feel free to contact us personally and we'll uh, answer all your questions. Um, in case uh, some particular participants were not able to make it, uh, this uh, webinar will be uh, available at the record um, tomorrow. So, um, and you can see and ask uh, us for materials in case you would like to review uh, this uh, event uh, a bit later in a more convenient time. Uh, all right, thank you very much for your attention and it was a pleasure to have you with us today uh, and wishing you smart investment uh, decisions. Mm -hmm.